I'm talking to. Uh, how many people here have used multi-site before? Okay, so most of the room, awesome. Okay, who's a developer? Okay, most of you, okay. Um, any non-developers, like business users? Okay, so smaller group, okay, cool. Um, so this is, the goal of this talk really is less about developing a multi-site and more about making sure it's the right fit for what you're doing. Um, I feel like one of the biggest things I have to do when I talk to people about multi-site is make sure they understand what it is, what it's not, and try to get to the heart of what they're trying to do with it uh, to determine if it's a right fit or not. Um, so let's just jump into this. Um, by the way, uh, at TV, send me photos. Um, we're using the hashtag multi-site. Um, links will be in the slides and on my Twitter. Um, so use that. Um, so a little bit about me. So I work at WP Engine. We're a managed WordPress hosting company. I'm a technical product manager. Uh, I've worked with WordPress for about five years now. A lot of that time was spent working with multi-sites. Uh, previously worked at Indie.com as an interaction designer. And I always like putting this up here. Um, my background's actually in theater and dance, of all things. Um, <laughs> I actually don't have a, a huge technical background as far as actual training. It's just things you learn on the job, building solutions. Um, so these are a couple of the brands that I've worked with, and every logo on here has used multi-site in some way. Um, lots of big names, lots of small names. Uh, but multi-site is a hot topic right now. I find that the inbound request for, I'm a multi-site to solve X problem is really large. Um, and again, it goes back to that multi-site will solve all my problems. And maybe that's not the right case. Uh, we'll dig into sort of some of those cases and what multi-site is a bit for and what it's not. So just a quick disclaimer. Um, my advice is just based on my experience. Uh, every project's unique. Um, you should never try to fit a project into a box. Um, there's an exception to every rule I make up here, um, and there are plugins that will do everything I say multi-site won't. Um, so let's look at what people are saying about multi-site. Tried to use multi-site to manage multiple sites and just got myself confused. Okay. I'm just gonna throw these all up here. I think my favorite multi-site is hard. I think that's true as well. Yes. Um, and then I don't use anything but multi-site. That's kind of what I feel like right now, but uh, it is only because I primarily focus on multi-site work. Um, so how is it being used? This is an excellent quote that I found from JJJ on WordPress Core uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and multi-site is now a utility for managing multiple sites using one installation, whereas the original version was to enable blocking it. What I think is interesting about this quote is that what people are trying to do with multi-site is not what multi-site was built to do initially. Um, and understanding that that's the, the frame that people are in when they say, I want multi-site, uh, is really helpful to determine if that's actually a good decision or not. So with my theater and dance background, this is kind of how I feel about multi-site. It's the Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, multi-site, uh, your best friend or worst enemy. Uh, most likely both at the same time. Um, so let's kind of dig into this. What is a multi-site? This is the first question I have to explain to people when they ask. Like, I'm a multi-site. Okay, what, do you know what a multi-site is? Um, so this is the definition on the codex. Multi-site is a, a collection of sites that share the same single WordPress installation. So let's unpack that a little. So let's look at some of the terminology we'll use here. Um, an install, this is an instance of WordPress. There's a network, which is a, a set of subsites that operate within that install of WordPress. One install of WordPress, many sites. Uh, and a site is one of those subsites. Uh, so that's sort of the language that you have to sort of make sure everyone's on the same page about. Um, I have a lot of uh, people who come up and like, yeah, I want a, a multi-site because uh, I've just got a site, I want to put a lot of categories in it, and it's like, okay, doesn't sound like a multi-site, so let's unpack that. Uh, so what isn't a multi-site? It's a network of sites that can be moved to separate hosts. By default, a multi-site is one host, one install of WordPress, and many sites go forth in profit. Uh, this is not something that you can have each site on different hosts, because by default, it is just one install of WordPress that lives on one host. A set of sites that can be easily separated into their own Principles. This one I get a lot of uh, people like, oh yeah, you can split sites out of a multi-site. True. Um, but dealing with uh, 
serialized data is not super fun and really vulnerable to errors. There's tons of plugins that say they un-multi-site. Um, I find that they, they break most times. Um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Essentially, when I talk to customers and to people who want to build multi-site networks, the first thing I do after we've decided that multi-site's a good solution is talk about what sites you should put on your multi-site. Because uh, that's really important because you're putting multiple sites together in one place uh, and there needs to be a reason for you to do that. Um, and then finally, a set of sites that can have different IP addresses. I had one client that uh, we got all the way through building a complex multi-site network and at the very end they had a very specific reason that every site, every sub-site on the multi-site network had to have a different IP address. Something that multi-site can't do. Um, completely ruined the project. Um, so one IP address, one host, one install of WordPress, many sites. So this is kind of how I talk about this to uh, the people who don't have a technical understanding of what multi-site is. Uh, it's sort of like a, an apartment, an apartment complex. Um, there's a shared roof, um, your hosting account. You've got common spaces, the pool, the lounge, the movie theater, whatever it is. Um, this is your file system with multi-site. You've got the private apartments. These are little private uh, nooks that have locks that are individual. This is your stuff, uh, not someone else's. You can't go into someone else's apartment unless they invite you. Um, so it's some rules that I kind of talk about. Be a good neighbor. This goes back to what sites are you putting into your multi-site network. Um, don't trust strangers. <laughs> don't put sites that you don't trust into your multi-site network. Um, and then always lock your apartment door. Um, never leave your multi-site unsecured. And we'll talk a little bit about how to secure your multi-site network. Um, so the first thing is, after I built a multi-site network, I always get asked, like, how do I manage sites? Um, because they all go to their WP admin. That is not where you manage your multi-site. It is in the network admin, which is the WP admin slash network. Um, here you can see that you manage your sites, your users, your themes, plugins, your multi-site settings. This is a separate dashboard from WP Admin. Looks very, very similar, but a very good distinction to make. Two dashboards for in a multi-site network. Um, so when you've decided that a multi-site is what you want to do, um, there's a couple of other questions you have to ask to determine what kind of multi-site you're building. Um, and the first one's open or closed site, and that's a really confusing thing to explain to someone. Um, terminology is hard. Using. And it's funny to even see the core project talk about multi-site because everyone calls it something different. Um, so let's talk about these kinds of networks. Let's just show this one. So the first kind is a public network. This is also called an untrusted network. This is where anyone can come and sign up for a website. Um, sometimes you charge them money for this. Um, so a great example is WordPress.com. If you want a WordPress website, you can go to WordPress.com right now and sign up and get a WordPress website open public network that's untrusted. Um, by the way, WordPress.com, gigantic multi-site network. Um, how big? We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Happy Tables is actually one of my favorite ones. This is my like exact, this is what you should go build to make money with multi-site. It is a highly specific multi-site uh, network of sites for restaurants. Um, the interesting thing is they don't even use the WP admin. They completely reskinned it to only expose restaurant-based things, menus, locations, uh, ratings and reviews, and that's all you can do. But it's still a multi-site network running on WordPress. Um, the university student blogs are another one. You log into the, the system, and then any student can come in, create a site, and get an .edu uh, website address, and instantly pretty much rank to the top of Google. Really cool thing the university is doing for students. So there's been some concerns about why you would choose a public network. Um, file types and uploads. By default, the fact that anyone can come and sign up means that anyone can come upload whatever media or other file types they want to your site, and that's risky. Uh, WordPress tries to help with this a lot, but we all know that sometimes WordPress doesn't. Uh, WordPress has vulnerabilities. That's just everything. Um, when you allow someone to come in and create a site and kind of do whatever they want, you don't have any control over. Um, this kind of leads to the next one, scripts and embeds. Um, 
I know I do this, I'm guilty of that. I'm like, oh, that was a cool like article or video or whatever, but it's not on YouTube, it's on this like really sketchy video site, so I'm just gonna like find a script on the website on the internet that like embeds that video, but whatever's first on Stack Exchange, I'm sure. Um, probably not the best thing to do to let just an untrusted person go and paste whatever scripts they want into the page. Um, so that's a concern. The other thing is copyright and DMCA. You're allowing people that you maybe don't even know, um, and maybe for free, not making any money off this, post content under your domain. Um, you could be liable for that, and you have to respect DMCA claims as they come in. So it's something to be aware of, that choosing a public network has a lot of baggage that comes with it. So let's start with the other kind, a private network. This is also called a trusted network. Limited site and user creation. You have to grant someone the ability to do this. A great example is WordCamp.org. WordCamp websites are in a multi-site network that essentially allow trusted members of the WordPress community to create WordCamps in a central location with a central uh, domain names and management system and all of that. Uh, another great example is company intranets. This is actually where I build most of my multi-sites are for companies who never expose these on the public internet. Um, giving each department their own websites. Um, and I think my favorite one is university networks. This is something where we're seeing universities finally embrace WordPress. Um, this allows them to have their main flagship property and then give every college, every department, every school inside of that university their own custom little website that keeps everything together in a nice package. One place for the sysadmins to maintain and all of that. Really like what I'm seeing with using multi-site, but those are private networks. Um, some concerns with private networks are too many cooks. If you grant everyone the ability to manage a multi-site network, you've got a lot of people with a lot of control over sites that maybe they shouldn't have control over. Um, by putting sites into a multi-site network, you're having them share things, and we'll talk about what gets shared. Um, the other concern is not enough cooks at all. Um, this is one of the other questions I ask when people tell me they want a multi-site network is, who's going to maintain it? Who's going to be the system or the super admin who goes and updates WordPress, updates plugins, grants plugins, adds new theme? Who does that? A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, someone has to do that. Yes, someone has to maintain your multi-site network. Um, the other thing is code, of, code changes affect all sites. If you've got a plugin that you share across all of them and you break that plugin, you've just broken all of the sites on the multi-site network. If you change a theme to customize, like. Uh, if only the, the thing used the excerpt instead of the body. You've just affected every site on the multi-site network using that theme. Uh, so let's talk a little more about that. The other uh, thing you have to decide when you're setting up multi-site networks is how do you want your URL structures to, to, to look? Um, there are two options out of the box. Um, subdomain and subfolder. Um, I prefer subdomains. It gives you a lot more flexibility with your URL structures. Um, it also is better for your SEO, and it's less <laughs> restrictive for your end users, the people who are creating sites. Uh, if you can see, like the subfolders, if the first person that signs up for a site on your multi-site network decides that they want slash blog as their user, guess who can't use slash blog? Everyone else. <laughs> um, so it's a little restrictive, which is why I like going with the subdomain route. Then everyone can have a slash blog if they want. Um, the other option, of course, is domain mapping. This is honestly what everyone wants with multi-site. Is everyone wants a lot of sites in one place. Um, we've probably all heard about summarize.php. Um, Google it, and it's, it will tell you how to do domain mapping. Um, but I will say there's a new project by Human Made. It's called Mercator. Uh, this is modern domain mapping for multi-sites. It's a fantastic project that's actively maintained by people who are building multi-site in core. Um, Really great stuff. This is actually how I set up domain mapping when I build multi-site networks. Go check that out. Uh, premium plugins do exist for selling domains in your multi-site network that allow you to make money off selling domains. It also allows you to auto-configure domains for your multi-site network, which is really cool. Um, and it's just another way to either make money or give your users on your multi-site network flexibility with their subsites. So here's the next point of contention with mapped domains is always use C names. Um, and let's talk about why. Um, so this one's actually burned me pretty bad um, because I can control them. The DNS for the multi-site. Built a big multi-site. I think it had like somewhere around 
250, 300 websites on it, all with individual domain names. What I did not realize was that they were all set with A records. And as you can see here, A records are IP addresses. A, a triple A record uh, is just the IPv6 version. So same thing, points to an IP address, essentially. Um, that's great until your host, for whatever reason, and maybe they tell you, maybe they don't, because it changes the IP address for your website, or for your WordPress installation. Um, <coughs> magically, you have 250 to 300 people calling you asking why their website's down. Um, and the even worse part is that because they were using IP addresses, every single one of those domain settings for their DNS had to be updated. Uh, and by the way, those all weren't done on the same DNS registrar. So you had to go figure out how to update all of them across various DNS uh, settings, and that was a pain. UC names. No matter what your host does in changing your IP address, you never have to worry about this. Your domains will always point to your mobile site. Um, always UC names. So let's talk about how you manage a, a multi site network. Uh, you have a new role, which is a super admin. Uh, this is all the things that a super admin can do. I want to note that last one, unfiltered HTML. We're going to talk about that one later. Uh, you can see the whole roles and capabilities here. Um, but essentially, anything that's listed here is what you can't do as just an admin of a site. Um, and this goes back to the who's going to maintain and upload or, and update everything because this super admin has to manage the users if it's a closed network, has to install plugins for the subsites to activate and use. It has to add themes for those sites to use, um, and it has to configure the entire network. Lots of management stuff that somebody has to do, and that's your super app. So shared users. This is one of the biggest reasons people like multi-site, is because I want to just log into one place. Um, all blogs have central user management, and that's super awesome. It allows you to share profiles across sites. When you're doing something like a, a closed network, it's nice to log in once and be logged in everywhere. Um, and one thing that I have found is that this doesn't play very well with two-factor off plugins. If you're using a two-factor off plugin, you're going to log in every time for every site. So if this is the primary reason you're choosing a multi-site, make sure that you don't need a two-factor off plugin. And if you do, make that very clear up front that you're not going to be able to log in one place everywhere and access every site. Um, here's the other weird thing about a shared user. Have you ever been on any of these sites and maybe been logged into WordPress.com? CNN blogs and TechCrunch are hosted on WordPress.com via their VIP solution. When you're logged into WordPress.com, you're logged into these websites, uh, even if you don't realize it. Um, and that's an interesting thing to decide when you're putting sites together in a network. Of course, you could just display none, this header if you wanted to, um, but it's very uh, interesting for a user to just be browsing the website with a WordPress.com account and signed in and see this bar. Can be helpful. Um, I can easily add things to my reader here, super cool, um, but I did not expect to be logged into TechCrunch. In fact, when I hit this the first time and I realized it once I moved to WordPress.com, I was like, oh, do I have access to this? Like, did I create an account? It was confusing. Um, so just something to be very uh, aware of when you're choosing a multi-site, that logging in one place is going to log in everywhere. So share themes. Um, you have to add themes as a super admin for the subsites to use them. Um, you can network enable them across all the sites. This is the theme you get to use and none others. Um, you can restrict available themes to subsites. You can say uh, site one, two, and three only can use this site. Um, changes to one theme will affect all sites using it. You change a template file and you break that theme, you break it for all those sites. Um, you change the design or CSS for one theme, you change it for all the sites using that theme. Um, again, this goes back to that shared file system, which we're going to talk about in a, just a couple minutes. So this was a fantastic, I used to say use child themes and for multi-site and literally make a child theme for every single sub-site on the multi-site network. Uh, I was told about this yesterday. Um, I will say I have only played with it for all of 10 minutes. It seems to work for me um, on the latest version of WordPress. This is a one-click button to create child themes for a parent theme. So every site 
that's using a particular theme, you can use this plugin to create a child theme for it that then can be customized for that site without modifying the actual theme. And by the way, you should never modify themes unless you're using a child theme. Uh, because the next time an update comes around, you're going to be really sad and all of your changes you've made are lost to that update. Um, so super cool plugin. Like I said, I can't put my full backing behind it, but in the 10 minutes I play with it, it looks like it works and it solves a lot of manual work. Sure plugins. Uh, install plugins on your network by the super admin so that other users on the site can activate them and manage them. So if you look at this little graphic here, which of these plugins is active for the entire network? Just yell it out at people. So duo two-factor auth is enabled on the entire network. That's right. Um, now, who can activate the disabled comments? It's a little confusing, right? So it's added to the network admin, which means that plugin's then available for every blog to enable or disable on their own subsite. Um, something that you kind of has to click for you as a super admin for a non-super admin to activate a plugin and to manage it, they have to, the plugin itself has to already be added to the multi-site network. Um, so if you're running a marketing team or whatever, and each one has a, a blog on your network, um, it gets a little hard when like one team is like, yeah, I want to use this plugin. And it's like, okay, well, let's contact the super admin to add the plugin. And oh, of course, this plugin is like the most terrible plugin you could have chosen and slows down the whole site because it runs on the whole network. Um, so just an interesting thing you have to consider uh, when you're managing your multi-site network as a super admin. Uh, you can also must use plugins. This is actually really helpful when you're doing something like Happy Tables does, uh, of modifying the entire network. Uh, you can make a must use plugin that cannot be deactivated that applies to every single site. So if you're building a restaurant-based website and you want to do a custom post type for menus, you can do that in a must-use plugin, and it will apply to every single subsite. Really cool ability to force your subsites to use particular functionality. Um, and you can't deactivate that through the admin. So that's one of the, the benefits of using shared plugins. Also, you only update plugins in one place. If you have a thousand sites on your multi-site network, updating them in one place is really awesome. Um, all right, so here's the interesting part about plugins in a multi-site network. Is you can end up with settings in multiple places, which gets a little confusing. Um, so this is a popular plugin, SEO by Yoast. Uh, everyone uses this plugin, and everyone looks for this general settings screen, where you control all of your general settings. This screen is in your WP admin. But guess what? There's another network admin settings page for this plugin, which is only accessible to super admins who have access to the uh, network admin. And that's over here. And sure enough, this plugin in the settings itself has to be enabled per site. Um, so just adding SEO by Yoast to your multi-site network and not network activating it doesn't add it to everything. You have to go into the plugin itself and add those sites you want to use this on. Um, just an interesting thing to be aware of. And you also get users who will, uh, you'll set up their multi-site and everything and then they'll come and be like, there's the settings that I, I've always used it, it's always been there, and on the network it's not there, and it's like, oh, it's in the super admin, which means every time you want to change your setting, you have to come bug me, because I'm not going to use super admin access, because you should really control who has super admin access. Uh, but just something to consider when you're using plugins is there's a way for plugins to integrate to both of these screens, and some do it a lot better than others. Um, so just something to be aware of. Settings can be in two places for plugins. So let's talk about the file structure differences of a multi-site network versus a standard WordPress site. Um, so when you're setting it up, you're going to make some changes to your WP config. It's going to have a couple of extra lines that define it as a multi-site network. Because when you install a single vanilla WordPress site, guess what? You already have the multi-site code on your server. It's, there's not a multi-site version of WordPress. It's the same core files. You're just setting a config value that says, hey, this is a network. Uh, that's going to generate some HD access rules you need to add to your HD access file, which is going to help it map domains and your subfolders and subnetworks to all of those different sites. Um, if you are actually mapping domains, you're going to have to install sunrise.php. This is where you're going to go use the Mercator project by HumanMate. Um, super awesome stuff, and it, it sort of 
uh, handles the summarize.php in a lot better way than the uh, recommended core version of summarize.php does. So again, use Mercator because it's super awesome. Uh, and then WP Content has some folders in it that aren't normally there. And this is, I think, where people are like, oh my god, my files are missing. I cannot find them on the network. It's because they're not in the same place on your network. So let's take a look at that. So plugins, themes look at the exact same in your file structure. So uploads is a different story, though. And it's a little confusing because when you create a multi-site network, you've got one blog already. And that website has all of its file in the root of uploads, which is what everyone chooses. That's exactly what we all expect. The second you start adding multiple sites to your subsite, you're going to now have a sites folder that also has subfolders with numbers in them. Um, and those numbers are the blog ID. And this is something that is very annoying, honestly, is because what is um, site number three? Um, and literally, there, there's a couple of plugins uh, that will add this ID number to your admin dashboard so that you can see that uh, your site.com is number four or number six or whatever. Um, and that's where all your files are stored. And within that numbered folder, that's where all your uploads are. Um, now, there's an interesting piece here is that if every site shares the same top folder of uploads, and that's where the root of your site gets uploaded to, with all of your media files, how do you grant users access to SFTP if you need that? Because if I grant you access to sites or to uploads, you've got access to every single other site on the network, which probably isn't what I intended to do. Um, so this is just sort of a pro tip. Rely on a host that allows you to choose the file path for your SFTP users. This would allow you to grant those specific people who, for whatever reason, need direct access to the file system to only have access to the file system of the sites that they're managing. Um, so something to check with your host if you're wanting to run a multi-site network is to make sure they allow defining that path. So database structure differences. This is where I love talking about multi-site because it's interesting. Um, so let's take a look at this. Normal WordPress. We should probably all be familiar with this. I put the asterisks by these other two tables for this next reason. Those two tables are duplicated and change a little bit when you have a multi-site. Um, so you've got your normal WordPress with those tables, and then you enable a multi-site, and by default you're going to have six more tables. This is where your WordPress keeps track of all of these sites on the network. Um, and then it gets really interesting, because we introduce a huge number of tables. Notice the N here. That's the number of sites on the multi-site network. You have the normal 10, uh, the 10 tables in your database, plus the six multi-site, plus eight other tables per sub-site on the multi-site network, all in the same database. So, and you can also see, here's the other interesting piece, is that those tables are prefixed with your blog ID. This goes back to mysite.com is blog four. Uh, all of those files, all of those database uh, tables are going to be WP underscore 4, and that's where all of my content is stored. And by default, one of the other things I get asked a lot about multi-site is, I want to share posts across all of the sites. <clears throat> it's like, mm, this is going to pose a problem. Because either I'm going to be duplicating a post in a lot of posts tables, or I've got to figure out something else. Um, so all of those tables there are specific to the site you're on. Um, let's take a look at what that means. Tables in one multi-site database. There's the formula. 24 tables. Standard WordPress multi-site installed with one site. 10 sites. That grows pretty quickly. I don't know if we have any sysadmins in the room. Anyone? No? Okay. Good. Because this is a problem. Um, let me throw this number up. Anyone know what this is? What do you think this is? It's a multi site network. Probably the highest number of your labs in the database. WordPress.com? WordPress.com as of this month. 95 million sites on one multi site network. 296 million tables in a single database. Oh my god. Um, that's scary just thinking about it. Um, so this kind of leads me to the next piece. Choosing the right 
um, Blue Hoops, this is not. Um, any of those bottom bucket $2 a month site, or hosting plans. When you're choosing a multi-site network, hosting is the utmost importance here because you are putting multiple web properties into one single place that is a single point of failure because it's one host, one IP address, many sites, and if something happens to that host, if they change your IP address, if they go down, if they have database issues, your entire multi-site network is then unaccessible. And I don't know about you, but 300 people calling me because my host is down is not what I want to be dealing with when my host is down. Um, so something really careful to be thought about here. Um, the reason I say use a managed host is because these are hosts that only host WordPress. These are people who are constantly watching and maintaining all of the infrastructure around WordPress, specifically for WordPress. Um, there's tons of players in this field, SiteGround, WP Engine, uh, GoDaddy, tons of managed hosts. You're going to pay a little bit more for this, but it's worth it, I promise. Um, I'm not going to tell you which host to choose because there's a lot of reasons you might choose one or the other. Here are the things you want to look for when you're choosing a host for a multi-site network. Automatic backups. If your host does not do automated backups, go choose another host. Like I said, on a multi-site network, when someone goes and changes that one file that you don't know about and brings down the whole multi-site network, guess what you're not going to be able to find? That one file that got changed. Um, being able to one-click restore those backups is even more important because if something does go wrong, you can restore your site to the last known good configuration instantly, quickly, mitigating those 300 people that are calling you because your multi-site is down and allowing you to focus more on the problem itself. I also put the ability to download backups here because when your host goes down and if through your host is the only way to access that backup, you've kind of just shot yourself in the foot because your site's down. Oh, and that also means you now can't access uh, your backup that's on your host. Um, so back up those uh, download those backups so that you have them always at your disposal to do whatever you need to. Your host goes down, cool, let's spin up on a different host and if you map to your CNAME, that's a lot easier to quickly and easily make that transition happen. Um, Built-in staging sites. This is actually something that many uh, hosts don't have at all. Um, and if they do have it, it probably doesn't work with multi-site. Um, what you want to look for is magically being able to create, click a button and say, I want a new staging site and get a staging site for every single multi-site or every single sub-site on the multi-site network. Um, super important because then you can specifically go and work on the staging site of the site you're interested in. Um, this leads me to my next point is granular deployed production controls from that staging site. So you have to have a staging site first to be able to deploy to it. Um, or some complicated workflow with your local development environment will actually you to push into all of this. Um, but you want to be able to granularly control what you're deploying to your multi-site. Um, so this goes back to the database structure. This goes back to the file system. If you're making changes to a theme that you know is shared across all of your multi-site, you want to be able to mitigate any risk you can when you're deploying those changes. Um, and I'm obviously skipping this up here where you're coding on the live server. No, don't do that with a multi-site network. Because you'll bring all the sites down and it'll scare everyone. And you'll be like, oh, the closing bracket, the question mark, whatever. Um, we all have forgotten that and it will bring your site down if it's multi-site. <laughs> um, so granular deploy control. So that is going to allow you to, when you're making changes to only a specific theme that maybe isn't used across your network, to deploy only that theme. Mitigates all of the risk everywhere else of anything that could go wrong with that uh, deploy. Um, this also goes back to plugin updates too. Um, maybe you have a plugin that runs on every single one of your sites and you need to update it. And that update contains changes that are going to modify your database. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a, a couple of minutes, but being able to granularly control what you're deploying, specific files, specific tables, is absolutely helpful when you're trying to manage and maintain a multi-site network but still continuing to innovate on that multi-site network. Look for extra security features. Because you're putting 100 websites in one place, 100 times 
the security risk is now in one single point of failure. Um, this kind of goes back to the what sites are on your network. Um, if you're hosting, I don't know, so, uh, the president's blog on your multi-site network, it's probably a lot of security risk just for your other users. Um, so this goes back to like understanding who's on your network. Uh, many managed hosts have a ton of added security that just isn't in WordPress because it can't be. Uh, this is like a automatic IP blacklisting. This is where a, a host can go and across their entire network of sites look for bad actors. Um, this could be things like ISIS trying to hack WordPress websites, which, by the way, has been a big target as of late. Um, those that come from an IP address, cool, we're just going to automatically blacklist that because we know it's a bad uh, IP range. Um, hosts have all sorts of these cool tricks that allow them to do this. Oh, a single IP address to hit uh, all of the, the login pages across the site, uh, across the entire network. Um, let's just block that IP address. These are cool things hosts are doing automatically. Um, to help protect your site. It's one single WordPress install, one single point of failure. Any additional security you can have that wraps that is even better and keeps your multi-site safer. No limitations. I've gotten burned by this. Um, I used to work at WP Engine now, but I didn't before, and I hosted with other places. And building a multi-site network, uh, we chose to do subfolders, and the host that I was on at the time that I was building that, cli that uh, client site on didn't support multi-site subfolders. We went through and I had them sign up and pay a good amount of money and then we went to deploy it to production and that was not a supported configuration on the host. Um, wasted their time, wasted a whole lot of other time trying to find another host, a lot of time. This was time sensitive as well. Um, understand what your hosts require um, and make sure you fit into that box. Use version control. That's all I'm gonna say about this. Um, that's a whole topic on its own. Um, being able to instantly see what has changed, the diff, uh, be able to roll back is super important with multi-site because when that one file gets changed by someone, you want to know exactly who to blame um, and have them fix it. This brings me to the next point is massive multi-site networks. This is the WordPress.com. You know, if you're going to build a multi-site network and want it to be 300 million sites, um, you really have to think about what host you're choosing. And the honest the thing here is, plan to spend a lot of money or just hire success admins, which, by the way, are a lot of money. So either way, you're going to spend a lot of money. So hopefully you're making money off of that massive multi-site network. Um, so there's some thoughts there for choosing the right host. Um, I'm just going to say that WP Engine actually does all of the things on this list. Um, just something to consider. But look for these features when you're building multi-site networks. So let's talk about some, some things to do when you're building a multi-site network. Define disallow file mods. This is, I think, my favorite thing to do on every single WordPress site I build. Multi-site or not, disable file mods. Have you ever been in the themes or the plugins uh, tab in the WP admin and you notice like this cool little uh, editor page that like you can go in and choose files and oh, you can see the contents of the PHP of that file and it also has a save button. Um, so I can go in there and like make changes to my theme files while, from the WP admin. Like I don't even need to SFTP or do version code. Like, yeah, who would want that? Cool, until you don't do the closing bracket on that and click save and you just brought down the multi-site network uh, that has 300 clients on it. And by the way, you can't get back to that same page because the site's down. Um, this setting, removes the admin file editor. Um, just please go set this on every single WordPress site you have. There is little to no reason to have that there. Just remove it. And if someone complains, that's when you start the discussion of, okay, let's talk about getting you SMTP access. Or even better, let's set you up as a Git user so you can use version control of the site. Um, define do not upgrade global tables. Um, this goes back to the updates piece is when you've got a lot of sites, um, you've probably got a lot of plugins, and those plugins have updates. And we all know what happens to sites that don't upgrade WordPress, that don't upgrade plugins, there's vulnerabilities. And when you don't keep your multi-site network updated, you've collected a whole lot of sites that now are potential targets at a single point of failure. Not updating your multi-site network 
is a huge problem. Um, and this essentially allows you to maintain the way you're updating your multi-site network. Um, this is primarily best for large sites. This is going to prevent your plugins from going and doing expensive database queries um, to upgrade themselves whenever automatic update runs. Um, this goes back to the who is going to maintain this uh, multi-site as a super admin. Go figure that out and then if you have a large site, like I promise you WordPress.com does not have this enabled. They have this disabled so that they can manage those updates. The other one is Network Admin Menu. This allows you to add cool, quick links for your users. Um, as you can see here, I'm in the uh, network, uh, the site, the, the WP Admin for just one site. Um, WP Engine has added custom links here that allow me to quickly get places. Uh, you do that through this add action, which is really helpful to just add those quick links you need for your users. Um, this sort of goes back to customizing the interface for your users. Make it as easy as possible for them to get to the settings they need uh, and maintain and manage those settings. Put up don'ts. Current user can unfilter HTML. Um, this is what that does. This is what unfiltered HTML does. It allows users to post HTML markup or even JavaScript in pages, post comments and widgets. Not a good idea. Uh, by default, the super admin is the only person that can do this on the multi-site network. I don't even think a super admin should have that ability. Um, go search your code for this line, and if it exists, kill it with fire. Because unfiltered HTML opens you up to a lot of potential security risks. Even if it is your super admin who maybe went and Googled on Stack Overflow and chose the first script that, I don't know, somehow introduced a security uh, risk. Uh, if you need unfiltered HTML, really ask yourself, what are you trying to do? Uh, if it's embed content that maybe you're going to do a lot, maybe you should build a short code that safely allows your users to add those scripts to your page. Just don't. You'll regret this. Uh, the other thing is, don't look through your network of sites. Um, unless you know what you're doing, this is very likely going to bring down your site. Um, the way that multi-site handles what site you're currently viewing and serving content for is complicated. Um, it changes context of what, con what site context are you in uh, that is interactive with plugins and themes and looping through these sites is a lot of work for the server. And when you have 297 million sites on your multi-site network, um, you probably don't want to iterate through those. Um, you'll probably knock your site over. Um, so don't do this unless you really have a good reason for it or a super awesome dev who knows what they're doing. So let's talk about quickly some use cases for multi-sites. I want to allow users to create their own sites with a network with some constraints. What do you think? Multi-site or not? Just yell at me, come on. Yeah. Yes? yes. You're saying yes? No? Any no's? Yes? Okay. Yes. This is what multi-site is meant to do. Um, create sites with some constraints. These are the plugins, these are the themes that you can use when you're part of this multi-site network. But those constraints simplifies a lot of things for a lot of people and you can focus on keeping your site, your multi-site network safe. Um, this is what multi-sites were built to do. And this is done really well by multi-site. Um, some tips, customize the admin here. Um, WordPress.com and Happy Tables both do this. This is what Happy Tables looks like in their admin. They actually don't even load the WP admin files. They have their entire own admin files that hook into WordPress. Um, super cool stuff here. I love seeing WordPress used uh, in really interesting ways that make it super easy for end users to only do the things they should be doing. Uh, Happy Tables is awesome. Check them out. Um, to multi-site or not, I will essentially manage all of my client sites. What do you think? Multi-site or not? What do you think? Getting no. shaking heads, no? No. So yes in the back? Only if they're very similar. Only if they're very similar, okay. I'm gonna say no. This is what everyone wants multi-site to be and to do. This is not what multi-site is built to do. There are a lot of things that are built to do this. Uh, a great one's actually Jetpack. Jetpack now has a feature called site management that allows you to update plugins, post content, all from WordPress.com. Connect all of your sites that are on different hosts, not in a multi-site network, not 
proxy for point of failures um, and manage them from one admin dashboard. This is the biggest reason I get asked if I want to have a multi-site network. They want to manage all of these sites in one place. That's not what multi-site does. Uh, WP Remote's a free hosted version. You go connect it just like you do with WordPress, uh, with Jetpack. Uh, Manage WP is a premium version of that that has a lot more features. Uh, same idea there. Uh, Infinite IP is a free version that you host yourself. So if you're a OCD security concerned person with your multi-site network, this is a great solution because you host it, you control it, um, you update it. Um, it also also has some paid add add-ons that you can pay to use that make it a little more functional. Uh, and then the last one, which is probably my favorite, is WBCLI. Go script your sites to do things. Um, that's a whole topic in of itself, but a cool thing that you could use to manage all of your sites uh, rather than using a multi-site. I want to have a multi-site network where each site is in a different language. What do you think? Multi-site or not? Yes. Yes? I said maybe. Uh, and I've done this. Um, the biggest concern when you do this is SEO optimization. Um, you're, by default, going to have duplicate content, which Google doesn't like and can penalize you for. Um, href lang tags and canonical links are your friends. I won't go into this, but check those things out if you're trying to do this with the multi-site network. Remember, plugins like WPML are built to do this, and they do it very well. Uh, this is don't try to fit your problem into a multi-site box. Um, use solutions that are built just to do that. I have a lot of content that's very different. I want all my sites to look different, but it's still all my content. Multi-site or not? Yes. Come on. No. Yes? 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 I said no. Most likely not multi-site, maybe. Uh, why don't you map categories to tags, map domains to categories and tags? There's plugins that do that and will accomplish the thing you're trying to do with multi-site without all of the complications of multi-site. Um, or create custom templates that make all of those stylistic changes just for those categories and tags. There are so many other solutions that are multi-site for this that make a lot more sense that don't introduce the complexities of multi-site. All right, that's it. Here's links to my slides. Um, feel free to tweet me. I'll hang around for questions. Um, thanks so much, everyone.